Good afternoon, Minnesota. Governor Tim Walz here. My first responsibility as your governor of the state of Minnesota is the safety and security of the citizens. I know these past uh, several weeks have been the most disruptive and stressful that many of us have seen. Uh, I could not be prouder of the response that Minnesotans have given. Uh, you've done what was needed. You stepped up for your neighbors. Uh, you weathered this in the spirit that Minnesotans have throughout the years. Together, we've done things to slow the COVID-19 uh, movement through the state. We've uh, pitched in together to, uh, to help neighbors when they needed it, and the state made changes, everything from unemployment insurance to distancing our children, figuring out ways that we could provide childcare for our critical uh, workforce in, uh, in the healthcare industry. We also know we need to have a plan, a plan of attack on how we're going to, uh, to uh, battle COVID, how we're going to make sure that we reduce the impact, especially deaths of our neighbors. And the way we do that is we use the best data possible. We model that data and then we back plan with a plan to get there. Today, I'd like to take just a little bit of time to show you uh, what we've been able to do with incredible work with some of our partners uh, over at the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Department of Health. <clears throat> some of the things we know about uh, the spread of COVID-19 now over the four months we've been able to see in from China to South Korea to Italy to uh, New York, California, and other places, we're able to build a model. And uh, those folks over at the University of Minnesota Department of Public Health and our Minnesota Department of Health were able to put in some scenarios. And, and those scenarios are on a sliding spectrum. We, we modeled two of them. If no mitigation and COVID is allowed to go through the public, what would happen? Uh, what would the time frame be? And what would the loss of life look like? And significant mitigation. And significant mitigation is on a sliding scale, and it comes with its own costs, which I will address. Uh, up till this point, we're informing our decisions based on what those things show us. So we're taking Minnesota-specific data, and again, uh, we are in day 12 since we issued the executive order. Uh, we're in day 8 since our bars and restaurants closed, so it's very quickly moving. Folks uh, in a multinational effort with the researchers at the University of Minnesota and in the state were able to put in Minnesota specific data because we don't look exactly the same in demographics as Italy or China or New York City, um, but some of the patterns that emerge um, can be modeled. So the demographic data is ours to the best of our ability and we're using the best scientific data that we're gathering across the world on COVID-19. I do wanna stress as any researcher will tell you this, there are still uncertainties in the modeling. Um, it will continue to refine and there's changes that we can make to that. And the modeling matters because the interventions that we do into the model will move up and down the number of deaths or the number of people adversely affected by COVID. So as more information comes in daily, the model is continuing to be updated. First of all, what we know about COVID-19, um, it, it transmits it, uh, at a faster rate than many things that we've seen. We know, and many of you out there today, um, maybe were infected, were asymptomatic through the entire time and are out the other end of it. Uh, about 85% of people will experience mild non-hospitalization um, type of symptoms, the dry cough, the runny nose, the aches and pains, the fever. Uh, not always, but some of those. Uh, but what we do know is, is that 15% of the population will require some type of hospitalization. And of that, the most concerning piece is 5% require ICU. Um, if we just let this thing run its course and did nothing, um, upwards of 74,000 Minnesotans could be killed by this. Of course, that would be impact those with compromised immune system, the elderly. But at this point in time, we're starting to see new research that shows that all age groups. Here in Minnesota, our cases range from six months to 94 years. Um, at this point in time, because of the incredible work and because of the care we're getting, uh, we only have one death. We do have 12 people in ICU. That's up from seven yesterday. That is a critical number. The objective of everything we're doing here is it's too late to flatten the curve as we talked about. The testing regimen was not in place soon enough for us to be able to do that or expand it enough. So what our objective is now is to move the infection rate out, slow it down and buy time so that the resources of the ICU and the hospitals and the things that we're going to talk about today can be stood up to address that. Because if you get sick and if you need hospitalization and if you need an ICU and if that ICU is available with a ventilator, 
and all of the things you need, you have a 10 times greater chance of surviving this. If we get to a situation which we've seen in certain parts of the world and the place we cannot get to is when someone can't get that ICU care, we see the death rate skyrocket. So here in Minnesota, our attempt is to move the infection rates out, bias time to have a surge of ICU units and then move to the testing phase so when the second wave of this comes through, we can flatten the curve and we can keep it under the numbers that we need. So in the first scenario they ran, no mitigation. We did not do that and I'll explain that. We took significant mitigation and I, I, I will comment on that. Minnesota seems to be doing this better than any other state and we're able to see that through cell phone data, through travel patterns and uh, of course anecdotally we're seeing it. Most people are staying home when they can, social distancing and making a difference. Had we not done that, this model started last Sunday night because it took us about four days of round the clock work starting last Tuesday as we thought about what does it mean to ask more people to stay at home or you're hearing about shelter in place. Uh, just to be clear, a shelter in place simply moves the date out. It doesn't do anything in terms of reducing the infection rates unless we have either a vaccine or therapeutics um, or increased ICU capacity, you're still going to get the same results just at a later time. So what happens with this uh, scenario you're seeing here, had we not done anything, nine weeks from last Sunday night, we would have reached peak epidemic. And I'll show you exactly what that means in numbers. But the terrifying part and the thing we cannot allow to happen is we would have reached peak ICU capacity in six weeks. And that 235 beds, that's not a misprint. That's what's available today. And that's what's really pressing on us um, to have to change. And I'll show you the plan. And, and there is a plan with a back plan timeline to let us get there. What would have happened then at six weeks, that time from six weeks to nine weeks is exactly what's happening in Italy, where you see the numbers jump from 10 to 50 to 500 a day dying because there is no ICU capacity and the numbers are still going up. That's what we need to avoid. That's the mitigation. On the chart you're seeing here on the left, uh, you're seeing the outcomes and the number of hospitalized. The numbers would go to about 60,000 and that would have hit, as you saw in the first one, at about day 63. We would have seen ICU capacity spike to nearly 6,000. I go back and show you again. 6,000 people would have needed ICU knowing that if they didn't get it, there was a 10 time greater chance that they would die. We have 235 available. So by the end of April, with no mitigation and the situation we're in, we would have seen thousands not getting the care and that's where the numbers would go up. The peak infection rate you're seeing on the right side with the blue line would see about 2.4 million Minnesotans infected. And as I said earlier, 85% of them would require no hospitalization would recover and that will start to build the natural immunity because this will come. Most of us, as I've said before, um, in the absence of a vaccine, most of us will experience this over the course of this, the next uh, year to 18 months. The hope is because of the slow mutation rates we're seeing in this, that maybe a vaccine will be moved up. We can't count on that. We have to count on the mitigation of moving the lines further out, upping the ICU beds, and then testing so to make sure when it comes back again, we're prepared to isolate the most vulnerable folks. Um, scenario two. Scenario two is changing person to person contact. And what we're going to ask for is, and so you get a chance to see this, you could go and you could ask for shelter in place. And I think what I, to dispel what a myth is, if we did that, and we have already reduced contact by about 50% in Minnesota, you have bought us valuable time by doing that. So the nine week number that you saw to peak has already been moved out by the 50%. If we went to a more stringent, which we will do for a short time, and it's what I'm issuing today, it will buy us a little more time. If I put on shelter in place indefinitely, what that would do would buy more time but it would not reduce the infection rates that would eventually be coming. It would not, the minute that we came off of that, barring a vaccine, um, numbers would shoot back up and ICU use would be overrun. 
So the attempt here is, is to strike a proper balance of making sure that our economy can function, we protect the most vulnerable, we slow the rate to buy us time and build out our capacity to deal with this. So significant mitigation that we're going to do for two weeks will reduce us from, will, will move us up from 50% uh, interaction, stopping social interactions to 80% stopping of that. We'll follow up by physical distancing, which we've already done, which is reducing it by 50% followed by a physical distancing for the vulnerable. What this time we're buying will allow us to do in addition to the upping the ICUs, to standing up uh, mobile hospitals, to providing more ventilators, more personal protective equipment, and more testing, will also allow us to identify people who should be sheltered at home for a longer period of time. And I think as many of you have said, and it, it, it's intuitive to say so, if we've already had it and we're not at risk, why are we not allowed to go about our daily work? One of the things is if still trying to understand the susceptibility of passing it on to the most vulnerable, we need to do a better job and they're doing it on their own. Elderly, immune compromised folks are starting to shelter in place. We'll do a better job of that. So the outcome, if we do this scenario is, we move to 14 weeks instead of nine weeks to the peak and we move the ICU capacity from six weeks to 11 weeks. When we back plan from that, and I have been in constant contact with our private sector hospitals, CEOs, um, I was on the phone today with the CEOs of, of Medtronic and 3M, and we're working with our private sector supply chain experts who are coming in. This thing you keep hearing on the news, governors are trying to compete against one another. When we go out to try and buy some of this, the federal government buys it, puts it in a stockpile, and then redistributes it. That Had that been done months ago makes great sense. It's very frustrating now because it's shorting areas that we have supply chains ready to operate that are being pulled out because of that. So we're bringing in experts who know about supply chains from the private sector better than anyone else. And in that 11 weeks that we're asking you to shelter at home for two weeks, to continue to social distance, to continue to go about what we've basically been doing over the last uh, week and a half, that will buy us enough time that working with the Corps of Engineers, we will be able to transfer our arenas or our stadiums into uh, hospitals. We may be able to use uh, motel space to have stand up those rooms. We will be able to stockpile the personal protective equipment and get the ventilators into the system that raise that critical number of what hospital ICU capacity is while keeping the number of infections low enough that when people go in and we're reaching peak capacity, somebody gets better and moves out and another person uses that ventilator. And we keep rotating through as this moves through. We will get closer then to better therapeutics and that'll take us closer to a vaccine so when it comes back again. Here's the scenario as you see it moving. We move the numbers out quite significantly. The only thing we're able to flatten a little bit, and this is what we're trying to do because I believe at this point in time, our medical experts believe it and our private sector partners believe it, the only thing we're able to flatten is the ICU usage and its capacity. So we're still gonna see the same numbers. You're still going to see by um, somewhere in there on day 150 or so, Two million of us would have had this at one time or another. 85% um, recovered, 15% hospitalized, 5% in ICU. The thing that Minnesota is going to do is ensure that if you need an ICU, it's there. If you need the PPE to do the testing or the first responders that need to be there, that will be there. If you need a ventilator here in Minnesota, 15% of the global supply of ventilators is made by Medtronic. They are at the forefront. The bulk of the N95 respirator masks are made by 3M, Honeywell, and others. A lot of you listening today in manufacturing have stepped up to say you'll help fill the void. So the severe impact is going to be there. I recognize that, again, if we, we could change this last one, if we had, and we're asking for two weeks, and I'm asking for your patience, your cooperation, and your understanding that if I'm asking you to sacrifice 
I'm asking businesses to sacrifice. We're doing everything we can on the back end to provide a safety net. The federal government's movement on the stimulus and stimulus three is going to be helpful. The Minnesota legislator is, legislature is doing incredible bipartisan work to make sure that we're there to provide that safety net. I know how painful this is, but if we chose to shelter in place uh, for five months, uh, I think all of us understand what the implications would be. And all that would happen is if we didn't do this surge on capacity is we would move these lines to the right and still be in the same position. I don't believe that it's prudent to try and shelter in place to a vaccine is there. I don't believe that in the long run, the damage that's done um, to the economy allows us to have those resources necessary as we get smarter and get more information about who can be quarantined and how we can build up the production line. Once they start to stand up, ventilators will be being produced at a much higher rate. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to do smart mitigation. We're going to push back the, the peak time and we're going to use this time wisely. We're using every minute today to step up the supply lines, um, that supply chain on PPEs, on testing. Um, and again, so many people helping the Mayo Clinic's capacity to help. Um, others in Fairview and others who are stepping up are making a huge difference in this. We can get ahead of it and that testing piece will be very important down the road a little further. And of course, all the work is being done on improving treatments and adding new ones. So today, here's what I'm asking you to do, Minnesota. And uh, my pledge to you is, is to use the valuable time you're giving us to build the coalitions, public and private, to produce those ICU units, to produce the necessary uh, PPE, uh, that keeps our neighbors safe and drops that number of fatalities significantly. We're going to limit movement outside the homes beyond essential needs. Effective Friday, March 27th at 11.59 p.m. to Friday, April 10th. And I want to be clear, there is no magic around a two-week period. We have weighed out the variables here. We believe at this point in time, as of today, that buys us enough time. We may ask or need to see what's happening with production lines to be able to adjust that accordingly. But we also understand those of you out there who have taken great pains in your manufacturing facilities to do uh, social distancing, who have done great pains to pay your workers and pay their health care. Uh, we owe it to you to have this as compressed as we possibly can to use the time wisely and allow us to move on. Um, we're going to continue with the closure of bars and restaurants and other public accommodations. Um, that was from the earlier executive order that will extend to May 1st at 5 p.m. And we're authorizing the Commissioner of Education to, to implement our distant learning plan that is ready to start um, on Monday the 30th. Continue that till May 4th. So some of the things you're going to be asking, there, there are a million questions here. We're thinking about all of the things you're asking and, and again, it all matters. I spent time this morning um, with Archbishop Hebda and the, the Catholic bishops uh, understanding that there is a health component, there is a mental health component, there is a uh, economic component of this, there's a social component, and there's a spiritual component about understanding as life goes on, how do we continue to address all of those needs for Minnesota. So we're trying to think of ways to make sure that we're doing the best science on social distancing, but allowing you to live a life that allows those things to get done. So I just am gonna hit on a few. This isn't anything. Um, you're still able to, of course, if you need to go to the doctor, safety things you need to do, of course you need to do that. Outdoor activities, be smart about this. Don't congregate together, um, but if you can get out and, and social distance and, and walk, that's good things. If you're running, please do so and, and, and stay away from one another, but uh, those are things you can continue to do. You need to get out to the grocery stores, you need to get gasoline, those things will still be permitted. We're not keeping you in your house. We're asking you, we're asking you because it's gonna take co uh, cooperation and collaboration. Stay home, stay home and do these things. Essential and interstate travel, um, when those situations come up, care of others, displacement, relocation. This is by all means uh, not an exhaustive list, but it starts to give you some ideas. This does not mean you don't step out of your house. This does not mean that you can't do some of the things that keep life functioning on, but it does mean that we're getting more restrictive to get us to that 80%, which bends that curve to the right. 
And of course, workers who provide essential services. Um, we use this and the way they figure this is the cybersecurity and infrastructure. When we've gone through these things, whether it's a, uh, a man-made disaster, whether it's a, an act of nature, or in this case now where it's a global pandemic, things that are deemed as um, critical infrastructure, healthcare, law enforcement, childcare, food and agriculture. Many of you out there are listening how you get added. And I wanna be clear, if you are not on this list, um, that does not mean that the, the economic activity you provide, if, if you are a shop owner providing retail sales, um, you are a part of the fabric of this state and, and, and absolutely important. It's just that at this point in time, we are trying to reduce those activities the best that we can to keep things functioning. So your heat stays on, your internet service is still provided. All this that we're doing is to keep those, uh, of course, first line uh, defense of firefighters, police, and then of course the healthcare workers safe and buy them some time to get, uh, to get things stood up. By staying home, we're gonna limit the spread of this. We're gonna buy that time. Um, we'll build out hospital capacity, you see it up here. We're going to increase testing simultaneously, and that will obviously be more important on the back end. Um, and we're going to get those ICU units up. We know what it takes now. Our partners are there. We're working, and I just got off the phone with the 50 governors. Um, governors are building consortiums. I spent considerable time this morning with Governor Burgum of North Dakota, understanding that what happens when Wisconsin has one order, Minnesota has another order, and North Dakota has another order. Governors understand the importance of this. I get it as people travel back and forth that you can have local reinfection. We're seeing that in Asia. That's why we need to prepare for, once we get a handle on this, once we go through the first burn of COVID-19, that now the lessons learned allow us to handle it on the front ends. And governors are thinking about that of how we could work together. As new data comes in, we will update this. And I can tell you, as I looked at those models and you look at 74,000 of our neighbors, that is an unacceptable number. We can't allow that to happen. There are really two things at this point that we can add into the model. And when you put numbers into it, it changes the outputs. One of those is the r naught, which is the measure of how many people infect other people and, and how that makes that spread. You can change that number by limiting social interaction. And the other number that makes a difference in who lives and who doesn't is by changing the ICU and the healthcare capacity and healthcare provider safety and security. And we're going to take a balanced approach of changing both of those, which still will allow us to function um, and using the safety net in the short run that the federal government's giving, just some of the things that, that we're hearing and we'll get that, that information out there. They're extending unemployment insurance, I believe for 13 weeks with the federal government paying for that. That now allows us to keep our system in place for up to 39 weeks, helping on that. They're also taking into those of you out there listening who are independent contractors who might rent a barber chair or a salon chair to get you into the system to help you and those independent business owners. We need to make sure that that back end is there because this day will come when we're done with this. It will come when we will stand back up. We need to make sure that all the hard work that you've put in, the sacrifice you've put in, allows you to start back up again and, and to benefit from that. So um, it's an unprecedented challenge for us, but it's one that I truly believe, and I think I told you earlier that data showed that by cell phone and movement. Minnesotans have risen to the occasion. We've slowed it, um, but again, make no mistake, slowing it's not going to stop it. It's not going to change the reality. This is a human issue with mathematics that are driving it. Um, if we are smart and we believe Minnesota has done this and talking with the incredible medical device companies, the medical institutions that are here, the healthcare providers, and a very strong safety net of our nonprofits and foundations, Minnesota is as well prepared as any state to handle this. The collaboration and cooperation that the legislature has provided has given me the resources to be able to move quickly and swiftly. And as we've said every time, to move with data and to move with an outcome in mind, not to be moved by fear and not to be moved because something seems simple, but moved with what will actually make a difference. So uh, Minnesotans, we're in this together. I'm asking you to buckle it up uh, for a few more weeks here. I'm asking our manufacturers to step it up and provide um, for the ICU units. Uh, we're going to draw upon all of the resources that we have 
and, and make sure we get through this together. So I will be addressing daily, just like normal, with our healthcare folks, uh, our commissioner of deed, uh, Joe Kelly over at Emergency Management. And so today even, we'll follow this up with a lot of the questions that you have. What I would ask all of you is to follow the media. Don't trade in, 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 in theory or, or innuendo. Try and get the best facts possible. If something is not working for you, try and access sites where we can get it. Tell us what we can do better for you and believe in your neighbor. And I want to just uh, uh, say, I, I saw the wonderful story when I opened my paper of neighborhoods that are getting out, social distancing and, uh, and doing uh, physical training, PT together in the mornings. Uh, that's the Minnesota spirit. We'll get through this and more information will follow up. Thank you, Minnesota.